Welcome in to the Punt and Pass Podcast. I'm your host, Drew Butler, joined alongside by my co-host, Aaron Murray. Be sure to follow us on social media, at Punt and Pass on Twitter and Instagram. I am at Drew Butler. Aaron is at AaronMurray11, and head on over to puntandpass.com for everything that you need to stay up to date in the world of college football. It's got our YouTube page, which is blowing up. I had somebody, Aaron, comment, said, I can't believe you guys only have 200 subscribers. It's such a great YouTube yeah. channel. I agreed with him. I said, you're totally right. Two handsome guys, two very successful handsome guys talking about college football. Why wouldn't it blow up? But we appreciate everybody checking it out. Puntandpass.com. It's got our blog up there. Punt, pass, and pick. Our merchandise page. And everywhere the podcast is available. What a crazy week it's been. Wow. It doesn't seem like the craziness is going to stop anytime soon. And Aaron... We're going to rock and roll heading into this weekend. It's Georgia-Florida week. That's right. Obviously, we're an SEC-centric podcast, and this game should dominate most of the headlines throughout the weekend. Of course, Clemson visits Notre Dame. That's a top-five matchup. The Pac-12 is back. The MAC kicked off last night. Buddy, college football is in full swing. We're going to dive all into it. You're in L.A., though, on the West Coast. What's going on, my man? Yeah, man, uh, I got the I actually got a Friday night action, which I'm kind of pumped about. I had San Jose State at San Diego State. Good game. Two undefeated teams in the uh, Mountain West. San Diego State is is freaking awesome, man. Their defense is legit. They got some running backs back there. I had them last week as well. I mean, they've got five dudes that could all start. Yeah. They just rotate them all in. This kid named Greg Bell, who's a transfer in, is uh, he, he's a stud. So I'm excited that I got the red eye back right after the game, man. I'm, I'm taking off like at 11. 50 at night, land at 7.30 in the morning on Saturday. Going to pick up Sharon, the baby, and the dogs. Love it. Go to, uh, go to the lake. Yes. Drink. Yes. And watch Georgia, Florida, and some great football. So I'm like, I get to enjoy a nice weekend of football, so I'm, I can't complain too, too much. And it looks like the weather's going to be nice. So And then maybe a little golf on Sunday. Come on now. This is this is heaven. Dial it up. Just get away from all this crazy. <laughs> I know. I'm having to deal with this I entire know. week. So hopefully at least – the uh, all the we're not we're not an election show or you know deal with the politics, but yes. hopefully a decision can at least be made before the weekend, so we don't have to talk about it, and we can just focus on watching football. So we're not having to do both. Amen, amen. Yeah, it's supposed to be fantastic weather. You will definitely enjoy the lake and some golf and some family and some libations. This weekend, for sure, a huge Georgia-Florida game. Again, we're going to dive into it later on in the show. I'm really interested to get your thoughts. I mean, I haven't talked to you much of the week. Everybody that listens to Punt and Pass knows your relationship with Dan Mullen, knows how much you love Kyle Trask. It's just going to be really interesting. So I'm fired up. We'll get to that in a bit. You mentioned you've got your Friday night game, San Jose State at San Diego State. A buddy of mine, Elijah Fisher, is San Jose State's punter. So if he pins him inside the five, give him a little hat tip. His dad, Brett Fisher, go. is the PT trainer for the Arizona Cardinals. Just an awesome family and a rock solid kid. Friday night, though, another good game, which comes on after yours. BYU, Boise State, two unbeatens as well. So we've got action Friday through Sunday in the NFL as well. Let's touch on the Pac-12, though, real quick. They're back. Yeah, it's November 7th when this kicks off. Just short answer, yes or no, is a Pac-12 team even going to compete for a college football playoff spot? As of this week, they only have two teams inside the top 25, Oregon at 12, USC at 20. And I'll just tell you right now, I would put USC on upset watch this weekend facing Arizona State. See, I think I think if there's a team to do it this year, it would be USC. I like their quarterback Slovis. They got a bunch of good receivers back from last year. They got most of their defense. So they, they're, you know, with a season that's been as unique as it is, and the fact they're starting so late and the uncertainty if they're even going to make it. You need guys with experience. You need a quarterback with experience. And you look at that conference, and and really USC is the only one that kind of checks off those boxes. So I think they're at an advantage to at least start the season off on a strong note. Um, you know, who knows? I mean, we. You know, you look at the SEC, who who thought uh, Arkansas was going to be a good team this yeah, year? Who yeah, did, great point. And Ole Miss would be putting up some crazy points. And, you know, it just this is a weird year. You don't know until you see these guys get on the field this weekend. I'm interested to see what the Pac-12 looks like. But at least looking at it right now, two days out, I think to me, USC has the most advantage, like I said, because of who they have returning to at least have some success early on the season and, and get that ball rolling. But I don't know. If a team out of that conference is going to make it, I, I don't see it right now. I don't see anyone that's going to go undefeated, um, and I think that's what it's going to take. It's going to take an undefeated Pac-12 team to be able to get into the playoff right now. 
Yeah, absolutely. And USC hosts Arizona State. The other top game, which I believe is on ESPN Saturday night, is Stanford heading to Oregon. Yep. That game's in Eugene. The weather looks kind of dicey, like 40s and raining. Um, but I like Jaden Daniels, and that's Arizona State's QB. And, and you and I talked about it on our Monday Night Show Campus Lore Live. With such a late start, such a long hiatus between playing competitive football against somebody else, expect sloppy football, except, expect bad tackling, expect tons of turnovers. And when you've got a very fast, very mobile QB who can make something out of nothing, I think Jaden Daniels could present USC with some issues this weekend. But you said it best you just want to see what they look like i mean who knows what you're going to get from the pac-12 today thursday november the 5th let's reassess next week let's kind of watch what happens this weekend aaron and we'll dive a bit more into the pac-12 next week um let's just head right into this weekend then i mean it's georgia florida so much has happened in the past five days regarding this specific game we'll talk about it first on punt, pass, and pick, but let's set the stage. Of course, Florida gets into the huge brawl versus Missouri. Who's going to get suspended? Is Mullen going to get fined or suspended? Georgia has tons of injuries on the defensive side. Richard LeCount gets in an accident. Thankfully, he's out of the hospital, but he's not going to play. Tons of question marks, tons of rumors. People were saying Dewan Mathis was going to put his name in the transfer portal. And, of course, you still got to play the game. Number eight, Florida, taking on number five, Georgia, in Jacksonville. 330 game SEC on CBS. And Aaron, the dogs are a a three-and-a-half point favorite. The total is 52-and-a-half. There's just so many question marks here. I'd love to get your original thoughts just on the state of both programs heading into the game. They both have a loss, clearly, as it stands now. The winner of this game is going to go to the SEC championship. Yeah, the winner of this game goes to the SEC championship game. And, you know, I think heading into it this week, if you want to, you know, talk just going back to Monday about the state of each team, I think you'd have to give the nod to Florida. You know, they're a little bit healthier. I know they got maybe a couple guys suspended. I don't think any major role players are someone that's going to make a significant difference in the football game this weekend. You got an offense led by Kyle Trask, who's thrown 18 touchdowns through four games, which is better than what Joe Burrow did last year at LSU which is crazy through four games. Joe Burrow last year had 17 touchdowns through four games. And, you know, the the, the mismatches that they're able to create on offense um, with the receivers, with Pitts, you know, who knows how good the defense is. I, I don't think they're very good. I think Missouri last week missed a lot of opportunities, but they still held Missouri to not a lot of points. Uh, so you think the defense is going to be a little bit more encouraged after that. And then Georgia, I mean, what is their identity on offense? Their running football team, is that enough to hang? Obviously, it wasn't against Alabama. Alabama, to me, is still a, a better football team in Florida, but it wasn't enough to keep up with those boys and what they were doing on offense, and that was with a healthy Georgia defense. Mm-hmm. So you know, the fact that Georgia is banged up defensively, the count's not playing, offense has been struggling, to me, all signs point to Florida being in a better state. But then I go back to what you always say, man, and it, it, it makes so much sense. I give you props on this one, and I'll let you dive Thank into you, a little sir. more. But, you know, Kirby versus Dan, and and, and it's, a, it's a huge part, man. It, it's, you know, players, players, players. But, you know, if the coaches can put you in a position to go out there and, and succeed and win and know how to call a game and know how to game manage and all that stuff, you know, that team has a better chance. And, and right now, Kirby's a better coach. Mm-hmm. And like you always say, until Dan wins it, you can't. It's hard to go against Kirby in this matchup. Yeah, I mean, so many times, and if you're a Georgia fan, or if you're a Florida fan, or if you're another SEC team fan and you just watch this game because it's such a good game when this rivalry happens, you know that so often in this matchup, the better team does not always win. The healthier team does not always win. That's not how this works. And Aaron, you and I played a bunch of times, and I played when Coach Rick and Urban Meyer were there, and then you, when Will Muschamp took over, it's real. I mean, everybody knew that Coach Rick had a hard time with Urban Meyer. Coach Rick knew it. We knew it as Coach Rick's players. All the fans knew it when you head down to Jacksonville. You could be way higher ranked than Florida. You could be undefeated. Florida could have two losses. But Urban Meyer knew how to beat Coach Rick. And guess what? When he left, Aaron Murray knew how to beat Will Muschamp. Will Muschamp knew it. Aaron, you knew it. All the fans in the stands knew it. Those things are real. And when I say they're real... They are real when you prepare for the game. They're real when you travel to the game. They're real when you're in the locker room before the game. Hey, maybe this season hasn't gone as we've hoped or thought 
It will. But when this ball gets kicked off, we know that we have a competitive and mental advantage because we've done it so many times in the past, regardless of Georgia's injuries and the attrition on the defensive side of the ball and the questions on offense. Kirby, I could imagine. I don't know. I haven't been to practice. I could imagine he has this calmness about him. He has this confidence about him. There's a certain stillness to game planning for this game that permeates throughout practice during the week, that permeates throughout the roster where these guys know, oh, damn, this game plan's sweet. Oh, okay, well, we see this. Man, we can do exactly what we need to do when this situation is presented to us. That's just what I think, Aaron. And I think you could attest to that. And I mentioned it. I was on SEC radio with you yesterday. It's like when a kid thinks it's his day to beat his dad at pickup basketball. And the dad kind of goes, oh, oh, really? Okay. Bring it out here. And then he stomps on him and wins 11 nothing or 21 to nothing. It's very much like what Kirby is dealing with with Nick Saban. And before the Alabama game, I said the exact same thing. I want to pick Georgia. I hope Georgia wins. But until Kirby gets over the Nick Saban hump, you go into that game watching with one eye closed. So that's just where I stand right now. We'll get to our prediction and our pick in a little bit. But a bit of news broke earlier this week. It was yesterday. I saw Anthony Dasher tweet about it on UGASports.com. The players only meeting was called by Monty Rice, nice. the baller linebacker for the University of Georgia. Now, players only meeting could go one of two ways. One, you got to get the team right. Two, things are going bad. Three, maybe coach just got fired. You need to rally the troops. You need to send a message within the locker room, get the coaches out, air out your grievances, kind of festivist style, get ready for a big matchup. I want to ask you your thoughts because one of the more famous players only meetings in recent Georgia history. 2012, Sean Williams called a players-only meeting. Georgia kind of had been middling up to that point in the season, and you and I both played with Sean. That dude wears his emotions on his sleeve. He doesn't speak too much, but when he does, buddy, he brings it, and it seemed like, and I wasn't there. It was my rookie season in the league. It seemed like that really lit a fire under that team's ass. Talk about that. Talk about the importance of Monty Rice calling this players only meeting yesterday. Well, it, it's huge. And and listen, this team right now is everything in front of them still. It's not like they're reeling and, you know, coming off some losses and, and trying to figure out who they are and their yeah. identity. This is a good football team. This is a top five team in the country. This is a team that has a chance to, if they get healthy in the defense of the football, continue to work on the offense, could round two versus Alabama make that thing close and, and possibly win it and, be, and then have a chance of playing the playoffs. So this is a great football team. It's just a refocus. Middle of the season, boys, let's just go over what our goals are. Our goals are to, to win the East. And right now this weekend, this game decides, like you said earlier, Drew, who is going to win the East. Most likely. Winner of this yeah. game plays Alabama. So let's just refocus ourselves, understand what's on the line, not put too much pressure on ourselves because at the end of the day, you don't want guys to be uptight. You don't want guys coming in there with tight butts, yep. worried about making mistakes. Um, but it's just more of a let's let's let's. If you can do more this week in preparation, if you can study a little bit more film, if you can get a couple more reps after practice, if you can do this and that and that in anticipation of this game. Damn it, you better do it because we're going to need all hands on deck this week. We're going to need a performance. Yes, and not only if we win this game. If we win it and win it in dominant fashion, we send a message that you know people are sleeping on us. People are saying, hey, they're banged up defensively. Hey, their offense isn't good. If you beat Florida this weekend, who, as we both said right now, should win based on personnel this game yeah. and health of the football team and the way they're playing offensively, you send a message throughout college football and throughout the SEC that, hey, we're, we're legit and we ain't, we ain't going to just fall over and die yeah. just because things are a little bit tough right now. This is the beauty of Bulldog Nation. This is the beauty of the Georgia Bulldog fan base. Every single season, regardless of preseason ranking, regardless of talent on roster, regardless of expectations, everybody in Bulldog Nation, myself included, Aaron, I would assume you're the same way, say Georgia's loaded this year, we're going to win the national championship. This is it. This is it. This is the team for Georgia. And then when the first speed bump hits, it's change the quarterback, Kirby can't do it, the offense is no good, the defense is banged up, we suck, we'll look towards next year. Let's pump the brakes for two seconds. And I love Bulldog Nation. Believe me, I'm a part of Bulldog Nation. Let's take a step back, okay? You just said it, Aaron. Georgia's ranked number five in the nation right now. They've got one loss. They were beating Alabama at halftime, right? I mean, let's look at the big 
picture here. The past two years, Georgia has finished fifth in the college football playoff ranking. That's one spot out of being in the college football playoff. Three years ago, Georgia was in the college football playoff, won the Rose Bowl, was one play away from winning the national championship. You're right there. Not all hope is lost. Everything is okay, and everything is still out in front of you. It's a big game this week. You've dealt with ebbs and flows. Seems like right now you're kind of in a little bit of an ebb. Tons of injuries. Lots of question marks. This is where it all comes to a head. So, if Monty Rice did deliver that message to the team and said, guys, let's just get it together. You know, we know what we're capable of. Let's go out there and play fast, play free. I think Georgia's much better positioned to go into this game with nothing to lose. Florida, on the other side, is playing with everything to lose. That's just how I see it from the outsider's perspective. I just said, Georgia was up 24-20 to against Alabama at halftime, and we all know they lost that game 44-41, excuse me, to 24. Think about this. They gave up 41 points to Alabama in that game. In the other four games combined, Aaron, Georgia's only given up 40 points total, right? That was an anomaly. Florida's defense, on the other hand, is given up 29.3 points per game. Florida's defense is ranked 12th against the pass in the SEC. Florida's defense is not that good. I think Todd Munkin knows if we can establish the run early, win the line of scrimmage, push Florida's defensive line around, and then present some passing opportunities, work Stetson into the game plan, you could have an opportunity. I do have a statistic for you there, Aaron, and it worries me a little bit. Stetson Bennett, since halftime of that Alabama game, 15 for 33, 235 yards, zero touchdowns, and four interceptions. You got to ease him into the game plan, get him comfortable, run the football, and then see well, what's presented to you. Week, yeah, they, they did. Hit it. Into it but, you know, I think for, for him, I want to see, because everyone keeps asking me, oh, is it because he's only 5'11", he's getting all these balls, tips, and, and obviously it doesn't help. But I Is he 5'11"? See- Come on, Murray. Whatever he is. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. I just want to see him move his feet around the pocket a little more. I mean, he sits in the back of the pocket, and if he's going to throw, he's like a statue back there. He, like, he anchors you know, down like he's 6'4". If, if you watch Russell Wilson, if you watch Drew Brees, dude, they are moving nonstop yes. in the pocket. They're finding the throwing lane. They're changing arm angles. They're not just sitting back there like a statue unless they're throwing the ball deep downfield because the way your shoulders are tilted, the way the ball's coming out, it's not going to get tipped. But, you know, balls from 5 to 15 yards – they're moving, they're grooving, they're trying to find that lane, Gotta and then they're delivering it. a strike. And to me, when he's throwing those routes, he's just he's just standing still in the pocket. And it just allows the defenders to know where you're throwing. They know where the back of the, you know, when you hit your back step, where you're going to be. And if they can't get to you, they're just going to put your hands up. Yeah. So he needs to move the pocket a little bit better. That would assist him in not getting the balls batted. But I love their game plan last week versus Kentucky. Yes. Run it, run it, run it. And, you know, I think we said at the end of the week, I mean, if you're able to stay on the field, you're going to frustrate Florida in that offense. If you're able to go for five-minute drives, six-minute drives, you know, all of a sudden Dan Mullen and that side of the football is going to be like, oh, my goodness, we're losing possessions. Mm-hmm. we got to make up for it. we got to go score now. Maybe you force them to start pressing a little bit and, and, and cause some mistakes on that side of the football. You know, I, I keep going back to this Alabama game because you saw what happened with Georgia's defense in that second half. Alabama was sustaining drives, driving it down the throat. Georgia's offense was not getting on the field. It's not like that really mattered at that point. But the defense was on the field for so long, and then the offense would be out there three and out or a turnover, and the defense would have to get back out. You just That's not how you play football game. That's not complimentary football, and of course the defense is going to get worn out and tired. If Georgia can sustain those drives and keep Florida's offense off the field and make Dan Mullen play call in an urgent manner, then I think Kirby says, Dan Lanning, defensive coordinator, we got them exactly where we want them. I'm worried about Kyle Pitts. Tight end, All-American, first-round draft pick, total stud. I'm worried about him because I thought Richard LeCount, physical safety, senior defensive leader, was kind of going to be the guy to spy him. But he's out. Kyle Pitts presumably could be running wild. He worries me a lot more than Kadarius Toney. Toney, of course, is the running back who is elusive out of the backfield, very much more a threat as a receiving running back than a rushing running back. I just don't see Toney... Aaron, 
getting behind this defense because they like to get him the ball intermediate or in the backfield and allow him to scoot and score. I don't think Georgia's defense will be pressed with well, those types of issues. If I'm Georgia's defense right now, I'm just going to play. I, you know, so you don't have to worry about the matchups with a guy like Pitts. I would prefer, you know, playing a little bit more zone, even just going to what we've seen from some of these teams, a little bit of drop eight. Yeah. And just saying, listen, for if you're going to beat us, you got to run the football. You know, we, you've been proven to us, and you've been proven to a long time that Florida can yep. run a football, run the football in order to win a win a game. Yep. I, I don't know if they can, and I don't know if Dan Mullen would get frustrated. I don't know if he has the patience to just run, 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 and then have themselves a 15 play drive in order to put points on the board. So, you know, that way you don't have to worry about the matchups. You don't have to worry about who's going to cover pits, who's going to get matched up with Tony in the slot. Uh, because that's a headache for, for coordinators. It really is. It, sure. It's tough. Do you put a corner out on pits, but then you lose a corner that can then cover Tony? Do you put a linebacker or a safety on pits, which I would not do at all, especially with backup safeties? So play a little bit more zone. Keep things in front of you. Don't allow the explosive play. I mean, that's when Alabama started getting going. When Alabama started hitting some explosive plays, yep. and they're able to score in a minute, two minutes. Whew, it's devastating. You know, they, like, damn, man, we just gave them a touchdown that fast. Don't do it. Don't put yourself in that situation. Make them earn it. Don't let Pitts take over the football game. Don't let Kadarius Tony somehow sneak one by you. Uh, and like I said, see if they can run the football in order to put points on the board. I totally agree. It's going to be fascinating. I, I really do because I think Georgia has the personnel still, and Kirby seems optimistic that Jordan Davis, big man in the middle defensive tackle, is going to play, which I think would be huge, again, to stop the run, or to drop eight and get pressure with three on Kyle Trask, try to make him make quick decisions. That's what Georgia is going to have to do. And I heard it this morning. In the past 14 games in this rivalry, Aaron, the team that runs the ball for more yardage wins the game. That's it. I mean, yeah. that's it. I mean, it's so huge. And Georgia is better positioned with that scenario. There's no doubt about it. Special teams-wise, Evan McPherson, Florida's place kicker, I think is the best kicker in the nation. This dude can bang it down from anywhere on the field. But on a field position aspect, Jake Camarda, I, th- I honestly say this with zero bias. I think Jake Camarda is the most improved player on Georgia's entire roster. The What he's been able to do, pinning opponents inside the 10, 20, Five yard line consistently is so huge. A game like this weekend where Florida's offense can score in one play, you better make them go 80 plus yards each time you can. You have to win and find that hidden yardage. I trust Georgia's coverage team, I trust their return team. So I think from a field goal standpoint, might tilt in Florida's favor, definitely do tilt it in Florida's favor. But from a field position and a coverage and a protection standpoint, you got to give it to Georgia, and that could play huge benefits, pay huge benefits later on in the game all right let's get our pick in we, we've talked about it pretty much all um pump okay. pass and pick I'm, I'm 20 i'm 23 and 17 on the season you're 20 and 20 so you have a great opportunity to have a good week here aaron Ooh, we need it. georgia is a three and a half point favorite the total is 52 and a half number eight florida taking on number five georgia in jacksonville um I'm going to take four with the points. I think yeah. Georgia wins this game by a field goal. Ooh, I, I like it. that. I like that half a point right there. Okay. Uh, so for fans listening, I'm not picking Florida. <laughs> I love it. Just so we can get that. Clear. I think that's Drew, very. I mean, that's why they put the it out there that no, Aaron picks Florida. I won't. Uh, make sure you read the entire thing. You listen. I think this is a close football game. Yep. You know, I'm not. Once again, I'm just not confident in Georgia's offense. I think if you ask any fan, they would say the same thing. We're just not confident in Georgia's offense to be able to put up a ton of football, to be able to put up a ton of points. That's why I think this game is going to be super close. Yeah. I think it's going to be extremely competitive. Um, and then I just, you know, you know how much I like Florida's offense. So I think they're able to, they're they're able to put points on the board. Mm-hmm. Uh, just not enough. I, I like Georgia to squeak one out, man, just late, late, late in the fourth quarter. Yeah, it'd be great for Jack Pod Lesney to kind of put a feather in his cap and take over for uh, Colt hero Rodrigo Blankenship Pod with a game-winning field goal, maybe late in the game, maybe last play of the game. Georgia wins by three or two or one, but as Murray said, he wants the points, so he's picking Georgia to win, but he's going to take the three-and-a-half points with Florida. I think that's exactly why Vegas set this number right there, Aaron. It's a great, great number. And Georgia opened as a five-point favorite. It bumped up to six in some places, and it's down to three and a half. When I saw that on Sunday, I go, God, that is that is weird. That smells. Yeah. And last time this happened, Georgia was an eight-point favorite against Auburn. And I go, oh, my God, that is a horrible line. 
What do I do when I see a line that just makes zero sense to me and it stinks out loud? And I say, what are these people even thinking in Vegas? I take it and I say, they're smarter than I am. I am smart enough to understand that. So I will lay the three and a half points here. But here is my reasoning. And you said it when we opened up this podcast. I am taking Kirby Smart over Dan Mullen until I'm proved otherwise. And when that fight happened a week ago, and Dan Mullen ran out onto the field with no mask on, shoved a couple of referees out of the way, incited a riot, got his players to fight Mizzou players, throw haymakers, and then came back out of the tunnel and riled up his crowd in the swamp to say, yeah, that's right, we just fought in COVID world. I mean, that's <laughs> attempted murder in my mind. All right? I sat there and I go, holy shit, you can't take Dan Mullen out of the game for next week. That's Georgia's biggest advantage. Dan Mullen has to be on the sideline, and guess what? He is. He got dinged for twenty five grand. He's going to coach this weekend, and for that reason alone, I think Dan Mullen's going to crumble in the moment again against Kirby Smart. Is Florida more talented? I don't know about more talented, but they're certainly more healthy. Okay. Yes. Is Florida's offense very well suited to take advantage of Georgia's defense? I'm not so sure. Is Georgia's offense suited to take advantage of Florida's defense? Again, I'm not so sure. It depends how they're going to attack it at the beginning of the game, what adjustments they make during the game. It's going to come down to turnovers. It's going to come down to field position. Will it come down to special teams? Probably. It's the most important phase of the game yeah, in okay. football. But I think Georgia wins by a touchdown. Okay? I really do. And look what's happened the past two years. Georgia runs out to a huge lead because I think Dan Mullen overcoaches, and these players have to overthink. They don't play fast and free, and if they do that, mistakes happen. Georgia takes advantage. It's going to be a great game. I'll lay the three and a half. Game. I think Georgia wins by four to seven points. All right, fantastic. Yeah, there we go. I love Take it. the dogs. Next game, we'll stay in the SEC. We can run through these pretty quick. I think this is sort of an intriguing game because South Carolina, to me, is up one week, down the next. Up one yeah. week. Down the next. And you got red hot Texas A&M heading into Columbia. A&M's a 10-point road favorite. And Aaron, I'm just telling you this right now. If Columbia was allowed to have a full stands, and I would sit there and I'd go, South Carolina's going to win this game. But obviously we know, 20,000, 25,000 fans. Can Kellen Munn and Jimbo just continue to keep this train rolling? Because right now, a lot of people are talking about them as being a team that could sneak into the CFP picture later on this season. Yeah, and, and, and listen, how do they handle praise is going to be my biggest thing. And uh, Jalen Weidemeyer, the tight end for them, you know, he's a Kyle Pitts-type athlete, and he's been absolutely tremendous this year. And Kellen's been balling. But you know, I just think the fact that the game's at South Carolina, um, you know, South Carolina's coming off a bye week. I think South Carolina got punched in the mouth a little bit versus LSU because they were rolling. They were feeling pretty oh, good about yeah. themselves, playing some good football to start the season. I think they said, hey, we're playing TJ Finley. We got a freshman quarterback. I just think they got smacked. They weren't prepared. They weren't ready. They didn't think they had to go out there and play their A game against LSU because LSU is not good this year. And like I said, they just got they they got caught from behind and then just could never kind of rebound from there. So I think they took the bye week, refocused, uh, and and to me, this is not an A and M team still. That is, you know, they're not on the same level as, as Florida. They're not on the same level as Alabama when it comes to offensive production. Um, so that to me, that's why I think this game is going to be a little bit closer than that ten points. And South Carolina, even with limited fans, that's a tough place to play. Yeah, Sandstorm Franken, um, you know, like I said, coming off the bye week, they're going to be a little bit more prepared, a little bit more rested at home. I like South Carolina in this ba- uh, ball game too, uh, uh, you know, with the points. Aaron likes the home dog getting double digits in a in a conference game. I, I mean, I don't blame you for taking that. I'm just going to roll with Jimbo and Kellen Mund here, and, and, and for whatever reason. Something seems different to me because they were able to back up that victory against Florida with the win over Mississippi State. I know that's not saying much. Well, I know that's not saying much. I can go feel the team right now outside. In the <laughs> okay. Again, again. Mississippi State scored, you know, what, 20 points in the past four weeks, something like that. So I I, I don't think that's well, what, okay. Well, you're, you're not going to tell your grandkids you're about mis- that you're, you're misreading what I'm saying, Okay. I just think it was important for them to win a game after that Florida victory because Texas A&M has not had a lot of banner wins in the Jimbo fisher Kellamond era. And I think A&M fans maybe now see the opportunity for Kellamond to realize his potential. All we've ever heard is how good of a quarterback Kellamond is. All we ever see is him falling short of that standard. I think A&M wins this game. I think they win it by two touchdowns. I think this might be 
an opportunity for AM to sit there and go, you can't hang with us for 60 minutes. So is it close at halftime? Yes. Does AM pull away in the second half? Maybe a late backdoor cover? Yes, I'll lay the 10. I'll take Texas A&M here. It's going to be a great game. Again, I said it's at night in Columbia. If it was 100% capacity, I'd probably say South Carolina might win this thing outright. Let's stay in the SEC. I think this is a great game. I really do because I think it's two evenly matched teams. Tennessee. About Mississippi State? Oh, God, no. <laughs> I mean, are they even televising that game? Uh, yeah, it's on SEC Network for oh. just because there's not there's only four SEC games. This you know weekend. what? Hey, I the would take. Uh, you know what? SEC Network has never given me the time of day, but if they called me and said, "Drew, we need you to host and broadcast the a uh, the the Vanderbilt what is it Vanderbilt Mississippi State game?" Yeah, I'd probably tell them no. I'd say no. I'm not doing that. <laughs> You're crazy. Nobody's watching they that. Put on that game that that for them. They're probably like, damn it. Damn it, you know damn what, it. though? Honestly, if they called us and said, Drew, do play-by-play play and Aaron, do color for this horrible game that nobody's going to watch, oh, I guarantee you, I guarantee you we would crush it. I would pump it out on social media. I'd put it up on puntandpass.com, and we would get better ratings through Punt and Pass than the yep. SEC network could get on their own because I didn't even know the game was happening. They've done nothing with it. You should call me. I would They're say little, no at probably first. probably a little bit of a shame that they had the game on their network this weekend. You're right. I would say no at first, and then I would allow them to kind of massage the deal and say, Drew, what do you want? We really want you to do it. And then I'd come in and say, let Punt and Pass take this thing over. Then yeah. we'd really be able to blow yeah. it up. I'm talking about the Tennessee-Arkansas game, though, Aaron. Tennessee's a one-and-a-half-point favorite. The total's 52-and-a-half. I just think it's a great game. It's at Arkansas. Yeah. Jeremy Pruitt needs a win. Sam Pittman, I'm telling you, this guy can coach. Barry Odom, Kendall Bryles, your boy Felipe Franks. Arkansas is not that bad. This will be a good game. I think it's going to be a great football game. I think all the games besides of it. I mean, the Vanderbilt Mississippi State game will be good because both teams suck. So it'll be at least yeah. competitive. Um, it should have been last night when all the Mac games were on. Uh, yeah, seriously, just hide it somewhere during the week. I like, I mean, I, I'm torn on this one. I mean, both teams have been, you know, up, they've had their ups, they've had their downs. Tennessee's definitely a lot more down as of late. You would hope during the bye week maybe they kind of shirt up that quarterback position, got that thing figured out. But I don't know, man. I, I just like I like Arkansas on this one. Um, you know, I think they're playing a little bit better on both sides of the football, and it's at home. And Tennessee right now, I just they're, they're not good defensively. Offensively, it's just been a crap show these past few weeks. I just have no confidence in Jeremy Pruitt and the Volunteers. I don't. I yeah. honestly have no confidence in them. I have a lot more confidence in Arkansas especially with the fact that the game's at home. So I'm going to take Arkansas on this one. I agree with you. I mean, last week it was great to be a Tennessee football fan because they weren't playing. You didn't have to worry about much. You got a weekend off. You could hang. Um, And I saw a funny-ass thing last week on Twitter. It was about Halloween, and it was like, your scariest college football sentence in four words. John Kincaid tweeted out, introducing Commissioner Dan Wolken. I thought that was hilarious. That was really funny. And I saw somebody tweet out, Garantano back to pass. So great. Oh, I mean, it's so funny. Awesome. It's awesome. It's, it's true. true. I mean, it's true. And listen, he didn't play terrible versus Alabama. Let's give him that. But, you know, they, they got to get back to what they do, just like Georgia. They got to run the football, use their running backs, that offensive line, and, and see if they can kind of, do something. I mean, this is a good Arkansas defense. Yeah, it is. Um, they can do some stuff on that side of the football. Then Felipe has been playing. Besides the game versus Georgia, Felipe's actually had a, a, a pretty decent season. So, and I and, and like I said, Tennessee's defense does not scare me one bit at all. Yep. Uh, I'm on the same side as you. Give me a home dog here. Arkansas plus one and a half. Aaron and I both like the Razorbacks to get a victory against Tennessee. All right, two more games. We'll round them out quickly. In the Big Ten, number 23, Michigan, heading to Bloomington to take on the number 13th-ranked Indiana Hoosiers in football, not basketball. Michigan's a three-and-a-half-point favorite, coming off a devastating loss to their in-state rival, Michigan State, a week ago. Joe Milton's look good. You're already hearing rumors about how Jim Harbaugh might jump back to the NFL after this season. Trouble in Ann Arbor. Is Indiana for real? I mean, come on. They should not have beaten Penn State in week one. Um, you know, listen, it's been a good story. They're at home, 2-0. You know, if, if fans were allowed, it would be a, an incredible environment for this football game. But they're not. Uh, I'm a fan of Joe Milton. I think the kid is, is super talented. And, you know, I just think Michigan overall is a better – they got more dudes. There's no question about that. Indiana's playing great football. Don't get me wrong. But right now when you line those guys up and you look at them coming off the bus, you're like, okay, Michigan has the guys. Indiana, 
you know, good luck. I just think they're going to come at more focus, especially after last week's loss to Michigan State. Um, you know, I like Michigan in this one. I think they kind of upset Indiana, and then um, you know, then then all of a sudden it's just all of, it's it's one team in in the Big Ten. It's Ohio State left as your chance to get into the playoff. Yep, I, I can't buy Indiana either. I think this is too big of a spot for them. You know, they're blowing it up on campus. They're talking about it on Big Ten Network. This could be the inflection point for Indiana football. I can't even believe I'm saying that sentence. It's not going to happen. Michigan's a better team. Michigan beat themselves a week ago. You saw what they're capable of in week one when they dismantled Minnesota. You know what Joe Milton can do. Can Jim Harbaugh and the coaching staff get out of their own way, let these players play? I think they will. I'll lay the three and a half as well with you here, Aaron. Um, I just don't buy Indiana. I think they should have lost. I know they should have lost week one against Penn State. But Michigan should get back on track. And like you said, Ohio State's the clear cream of the crop in the Big Ten. Um, I can only imagine what the point spread is going to be like that, depending on what happens throughout this season when Michigan plays Ohio State later on in the season. So Aaron and I both are on Michigan, minus three and a half in that game. All right, and the last game of the week, top five matchup in the ACC. Can't believe I'm saying that either because it's number one Clemson visiting number four Notre Dame. Clemson is down to a five and a half point favorite. Keep in mind, Trevor Lawrence still out in COVID protocol. DJ Uyunglele will be taking over as he played last week and led Clemson to a victory over Boston College, the total was 51.5. And, and I'll just tell you right now, Aaron, Clemson is going to steamroll Notre Dame. Steamroll. Oh, man. Steamroll. Wow. Yes. That's, uh, that's aggressive. Travis Etienne's um, going to go and off. Yes. I, yeah, I would tell you. I think if it, if it was – I still, I think it's a sig- single-digit game, though. I do. I think if, if it was, say, 10, I would have taken Notre Dame. I think okay. Notre Dame's defense – is going to make this a closer game than what we've seen in years past when Clemson has faced Notre Dame and just just an absolute butt whooping. Um, when has Notre who, Dame ever won a big game? Ever, ever with anything on the line? I'm going. Notre, I'm going to go Notre Dame with the points. Take here. the just points. Go against you. Good. Against you. I like that. Take the points. I, I, I'm telling you, man. I love Notre Dame's defense. Um, and you know how do you pronounce? I'll let you pronounce Clemson's backup quarterback. DJ name. Ui Unga Lele. Yeah, DJ, you know he played well last week. I'll give him that. But Boston College's defense is nowhere near Notre Dame's defense on the road too. And you know just like we talked about with TJ Finley, Notre Dame's had a week of of watching the film now and saying, yeah. okay, what does this kid do well? What does he not do well? Let's not forget, man. This is only his second career start. So. That's a lot of pressure on a kid to come in second week against Notre Dame on the road, a defense that's only getting up 10 points per game. You know, this is going to be a lower scoring game. I mean, I'll take this as my um, uh, lock my, of the week. I'll take my lock of the week as the under here. Okay, 51 and a half. Okay. Defensive. I'm not sold on Notre Dame's offense at all. Um, you know, we'll see if Clemson's defense made, hopefully made some improvements from what we saw last week for Boston College because that was not the defense we know they can play. I think they come out with a lot of energy. I think Notre Dame's defense comes out with a lot of energy against the young quarterback. Uh, I think this is a lower scoring game, so I'll take my lock of the week as the under. Like that. And I think Notre Dame makes this a um, you know three to five point game, so I like that half point. All right, I love the under. I do. I just I, honestly, Notre Dame's not going to win this game. It's not going to be close. Notre Dame falls in big moments, and Clemson rises. Remember what happened a couple of weeks ago? Clemson against Miami, and Miami's the hottest team in the nation. And yeah, but that's when you had Trevor Lawrence. I, I agree, but still, I, I like think it's more ETN. He has, to, he, has to, he has to prove it some more to me. I'm not saying the kid's bad. I'm not against him. I think the kid's really damn talented. He's going to be an absolute stud, but it's still week two. You can't just show me a um, you know one game of football and, and me crown you an absolute hero, even if I do love quarterbacks. So. Um, you know, he does it this week. I may have a new man crush Monday next week. Yeah, I just don't think they need him that much this week. And I, I can't wait to watch this game. It's going to be an awesome yeah. game. There's no doubt about it. Um, and I will lay the five and a half. I think Clemson wins big. My flip the field free pick, my lock, which is struggling right now, two, two, and one. That hurts. That hurts my feelings. Two, two, and one in my lock of the week is Liberty getting 14 and a half against Virginia Tech. Liberty is undefeated. They're six and zero. Oh. They're ranked number 25 in the nation. Hugh Freeze is ready to get back in the SEC. He puts another feather in his cap, beats a Power 5 ACC team in Virginia Tech. Run with it. Take the 14.5 points with Liberty. 
That's my flip the field free pick. Like Aaron, like you're on the West Coast. What else is going on? Anything on the way out, my brother? No, man. Just uh, like I said, I'm just happy I got that Friday game and yes. get my butt we'll back. I was, like, you know, I was looking at flights and I looked at Saturday first. And I was like, man, I take off at like 7 a.m. and I get home at like 2. I was like, God, that sucks. Uh, and I was like, screw it. Let me see if I can get the red eye. And Boom. I'm going to feel like crap on Saturday, but it's going to be worth it when I'm just sitting on the couch watching football all day. So I can't bitch. I'm going to make Sharon drive from – um, yeah, don't fall asleep. Make her drive from Atlanta to the uh, to the lake. There you go. Put put your baby mama to work, Sharon. We we love you here. I don't know. Do we have to take the truck because we have both dogs. The baby. Oh yeah, and, you got the whole crew. So it may take us like two hours to get there because she's gonna be driving like a grandma. But <laughs> we can take a nap. Hey, safety, safety first. You guys man. got anything planned for the weekend? You're We're chilling, show. man. Gonna be watching this Georgia Florida game. Gonna be playing a little bit of golf. Um, it's member member weekend. So Clint Bowling, former Georgia Bulldog, um, guest host on Punt and Pass. He has an exclusive rights agreement with the Punt and Pass podcast. Whenever Aaron can't do it, Clint gets the call. Our listeners love Clint. Clint and I are playing the member member this weekend, so we better bring home some hardware. You know, because the funniest thing about my wife, she lets me play a lot of golf, but then I come home and I say, oh, we lost, or I played bad, and she said that's unacceptable. If you're going to be away from the family and play golf, play good golf. Don't play bad golf and waste everybody's time. I tend to agree with her. Wow. It's what I you say. That. Crack the whip. It's Crack the whip. It's phenomenal. Yeah. I, I expect it. nothing less from Jackie, especially – her guest performance yes. this year on pass. So absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. All right. Well, that does it for us. Be sure to follow us on social media at punt and pass on Twitter and Instagram. Aaron's at Aaron Murray 11. I'm at Drew Butler. Head on over to punt and pass.com. And we'll talk to you early next week. See you.